I am thrilled to introduce Alyssa Ballman as tonight's guest speaker. Alyssa received her master's in entomology from the University of California, Riverside, and has been an entomology research associate at the University of Maine for 12 years. And she's also currently enrolled in a PhD program at UMaine. Her research focuses on the biology and management of stable flies on equine farms. Alyssa is also the coordinator of the Maine Forest Tick Survey, amongst others, I believe, um, mm -hmm. which is a community-based research program. Alyssa, I welcome you tonight, and I'm looking forward to uh, learning more about insect management on farms, because I certainly have my fair share of insects, um, <laughs> and especially, you know, now that Triple E and West Nile's around, um, I'll take all the information I can get. So I yes. <laughs> will hand it over to you. Perfect. Thank you so much. I am so excited to talk about this area. Um, I also have horses and also have insects. So don't worry. We all are dealing with these problems together. Um, thanks for the background. I don't really need to say much, um, except that I do work here at the University of Maine in the Vector Ecology Lab, and that lab is headed up by Dr. Allie Gardner. Um, I am a research associate and also a PhD student, and our lab primarily focuses on um, insects that are disease vectors. So these are ticks, mosquitoes, and then we also do some veterinary entomology work. Um, primarily, I work with staple flies. And so here we just have a picture of um, the upper picture is us and our um, undergraduates for our summer field research. And then we have um, a large number of graduate students as well in the lab. So what's bugging your horse? Um, a lot of things. Uh, so this is our agenda for tonight. I'm going to start with talking about ticks and tick management, and then I'll move into the biting flies, including mosquitoes, deer and horse flies, um, and then stable flies, which are my area specialty. And then I want to talk a little bit about my own personal um, stable fly research that I'm currently working on here in the state of Maine. So let's start right uh, with ticks. So <sighs> at least here in the Northeast um, and in, in many regions of the country, there's sort of two main species of ticks that seem to be associated with horses. And at least here in New England, we have the dog ticks and these don't transmit any pathogens here in Maine. There are other regions um, of the country that do transmit pathogens to humans, but at least here in Maine and New England, um, the dog ticks that we have are not considered a pathogen um, risk. And the way you can identify these ticks is by looking for these white markings on their backs. So the, this is a male and female black or dog tick, sorry. And so they look kind of different, but they both have those white markings. And that's how you can really tell them apart from any other ticks. The other really common tick that horse owners encounter and humans as well is the black legged, um, also called the deer tick in some regions. And this is the tick that is um, going to carry pathogens and is responsible for the tick associated illnesses in horses as well as um, in people as well. And so you can see the black legged tick is just like the name says, it has these dark legs. Um, the first picture here is a female. She has a black shield and sort of the reddish brown body. And then the picture next to her is a male black legged tick. So he's more of a solid black color. And so if we look at them side by side, we can see that the dog tick is a bit larger. It's a little more robust. Um, and again, we are seeing those white markings, whereas the black legged tick does not have any of the white on them. So that's just a really easy way. So if you if you pull a tick off your horse and you are not sure if you should be concerned about it, um, one quick thing to do is just determine, is it a dog tick or a black legged tick? And that'll give you a lot of information. And it's also really important to keep in mind that ticks can be super tiny. So this is a photo that the CDC put out um, a few years ago. This is a lemon poppy seed muffin, and they put five ticks on top of the lemon poppy seed muffin. And you can see they blend right in. Um, so they actually, they zoomed in a little in the second picture, and you can see the five sort of clustered right in the middle. Um, but they're quite hard to see. And this isn't even the smallest life stage. These are the nymphal black-legged ticks. And this is a, one of the life stages that can potentially transmit pathogens. So you can imagine it's very hard to find these on ourselves, let alone our horses. So the two main um, 
equine tick related illnesses here in the Northeast is Lyme disease. Um, and this is again is spread by the black legged or deer tick. Um, and this one can be a little more difficult to diagnose because the symptoms can sort of mimic other illnesses, um, but it can have inflammation of the eyes and swollen joints. Um, it could also have neurologic issues as well. Um, you know, maybe some stiffness, change in behavior, sensitivity to touch. And then the maybe more serious and obvious um, tick-borne illness in horses is anaplasmosis. And this is the one that's typically associated with a really high fever, um, very lethargic horses, greatly reduced appetite. These are usually very obvious. Um, both of these are typically treated with antibiotics and they're something that you would have a vet come out and help you with your horse for this. So just talking a little bit about sort of where we are now with Lyme disease in the U.S. So here is a map we have. Um, each blue dot represents a county where there was a report of a Lyme disease case. This is in humans. We don't really have this sort of nice data set for, for horses, but you can imagine as it is increasing in humans, we're also seeing it increasing in other animals as well. So here's a map of reported Lyme disease cases in 2001. And then if we jump forward to 2022, you can really see just how much of it has spread across the U.S. So in 2001, we had a little bit in the upper Midwest um, and the sort of the southern New England region. And since then, it has really um, grown exponentially. And this is actually considered probably an under underrepresentation of the actual number of cases. A lot of cases go unreported. And so um, in reality, there's probably a, a large number of additional cases to what we're seeing here. And again, if we look at other um, human cases, this is here in Maine specifically where I am. And this is looking at the rate of um, Lyme disease in orange, um, anaplasmosis in the darker blue, and babesiosis. Um, the babesiosis is another human illness um, that these same ticks can transmit. And so you can see in the year 2000, at least here in Maine, um, we had virtually no cases um, per 100,000 people. We had a few Lyme disease cases that popped up from time to time. Um, we had virtually no anaplasmosis or babesiosis. But as as time has progressed, we're starting to see more and more cases. And we definitely do have fluctuations um, year to year. We can, you know, have years that the weather is very conducive to tick populations for a number of different reasons. And so we might have more ticks some year and so more cases some year. But overall, the trend is one that's increasing. And this is a trend that we expect to continue to see. We expect to see more cases we're seeing um, these black-legged ticks moving into new areas that they have previously not been inhabiting. And so we do expect to see more cases in both humans and our animals as well. <clears throat> so I just want to quickly go over the black-legged tick life cycle just to kind of help you understand um, kind of how it plays out in our environment. So here we have in the spring, we're gonna start in this upper left-hand side, the adult ticks lay their eggs, and then they hatch into their first life stage, which are these larvae. And it's important to note that tick larvae um, are not born with pathogens. The mothers are not passing on any pathogens they have to their offspring. Um, and so they have to pick up those pathogens when they're taking a blood meal from an infant infected host. So the larvae are typically feeding on really small animals, rodents, um, particularly uh, things like mice. And the white-footed mouse is considered a really important pathogen reservoir. That means there's a lot of mice with that carry the bacteria that cause these um, different diseases, Lyme disease, anaplasmosis. Um, and so what happens when that tick feeds on an infected host, it can then pick up that bacteria and now it's going to have that pathogen for the rest of that tick's life. Okay, so the larvae's had its first blood meal, that's its first chance to pick up one of these pathogens. Then it's going to just spend the winter hanging out underneath the leaf litter, and it'll come out next spring or summer, depending where in the country you are. And these typically feed on maybe a little bit larger of animals. They'll still feed on the mice and rodents, but they'll also start feeding on, um, you know, raccoons, um, 
fox and, you know, humans and pets, horses and dogs as well. And so this nymph um, now could potentially transmit a pathogen to the host that it's feeding on. And if it, again, feeds on a host that's already in, in infected with the pathogen, it's another opportunity for it to pick up a pathogen. And then that nymph is going to molt into an adult, and it's going to look for a host for a final blood meal. And this is typically larger animals. Um, Deer are a very important host for the adult black-legged ticks. And the adults, um, they're, they're larger, so they're typically easier to spot, at least on us humans. Um, so they're not considered as, how do I say, they're, they're not as risky in some ways as the nymphs, just because the nymphs are so easy to miss. But that being said, the adults have an even, even higher probability of carrying one of these pathogens because it's had the chance to have two potential blood meals already. And then that adult um, tick, after it takes its final blood meal, it's going to fall off into the leaf litter, spend one more winter, and then come out the following year and lay its eggs and start this cycle over. So I just want to show what the tick activity looks like here in Maine. Um, if you're sort of on a similar latitude, it might be similar for you. And if you're further south, you can sort of just imagine everything being pushed back by a few weeks, depending on how far south you are. So this is um, a calendar we have here. It starts in March and it's going until December. This is sort of like a typical year. Um, and these are the number of ticks that are submitted to the Humane Cooperative Extension Tick Lab. And so you can see uh, in this sort of the black line, these are our black legged -like tick adult activity. So we typically see them in the spring and an even larger number of them in the fall. Um, and the fall is when we tend to see most of the um, anaplasmosis cases in horses, because even though the tick is larger and, and is easier to see, um, you know, on a horse, it's still hard to find. So it's not like finding them on ourselves, which is a little more obvious. And then we have dog ticks, which again, are not transmitting any pathogens out here in New England. Um, and those are typically a spring into early summer pest. And so the spring and early summer always seems like there's a ton of ticks out. And there are, and then a lot of people say, oh, but by the time I get to July and August, there's no ticks out. Um, and there are actually ticks out. That's when the black-legged tick nymphs are out, and that's why I put this arrow right here. Um, this life stage is considered the highest risk to human health because they're so small that they tend to go unnoticed, and so they tend to have a chance to feed long enough to pass on those pathogens. So it's just really good to keep in mind, even if you don't feel like you're seeing as many ticks, they are still out there, and they are still um, a risk. And then, like I said, the fall, we tend to see a really big um, spike in the adult black-legged ticks as well. And these black-legged ticks, there's one of the things that makes them so difficult to live with is that they can be active anytime it's above freezing and there's no snow cover. So if it's below freezing, they're going to stay hidden in that leaf litter and they're not going to come out. But if you have a warm winter day, December, January, February, and we don't have a layer of snowpack over the top of our leaf litter, they will come out and they could potentially um, find a host. And actually, I've seen barn cats with ticks on them in February. It was We had a few warm days in that particular February, and we didn't have much snow cover. And sure enough, they encountered a black-legged tick as they were exploring um, out on the farm. So it's also important to know where these ticks are in the environment. Um, Black-legged ticks are very sensitive to humidity. They need a high amount of humidity to survive, which is why they spend so much of their life in the leaf litter. Um, and so they're primarily found in more wooded areas or areas with denser vegetation, um, sort of open, grassy, dry, hot, sunny pastures are really not ideal for black-legged ticks. So if you're looking at a pasture, the highest risk areas are typically on the edges because that's where um, the woods kind of tend to encroach and maybe <clears throat> you have a little bit more shrubby, woody growth in those regions. Um, and so that's important to know. Whereas dog ticks, they're in the woods, but they also do quite well in these grassy areas. So the most commonly encountered ticks in sort of open, hot, dry, kind of grassy areas are the dog ticks, which is good because those tend to be less risky for um, health. 
So one of the things you can do to reduce the risk of tick bites in a pasture, um, you can, again, just try to think about what you can do to reduce the um, kind of dense vegetation and reduce sort of that humidity that the black-legged ticks rely on. So that can be um, mowing the pastures so that you don't have a lot of the woody kind of shrubby growth growing up. Um, also important to kind of keep a cleared area between the woods and the pastures. So you can kind of think of like a strip barrier between the tick habitat and where your horses are spending their time. Um, also another thing, invasive species uh, really seem to be strongly correlated with tick populations. So ticks love invasive plant species because they tend to grow in really dense thickets and it really creates the perfect environment for black-legged ticks. So if you have invasive species that are forming sort of dense areas of vegetation, whether it's um, barberry, honeysuckle, um, bittersweet, plants like that, um, those are all known to be associated with higher tick density. So it's something to keep in mind. Um, also managing mice on your property, um, which through cleaning up spilled grain, um, or however you decide to manage mice. Just remember that the mouse is one of the most important host reservoirs um, or pathogen reservoirs, meaning that this is the one that is transmitting a lot of these pathogens to the tick. So trying to reduce the mouse numbers in and where your horses are living could also help as well. And finally, don't encourage deer if, um, if at all possible. I know a lot of people live in rural areas and there are deer everywhere. Um, I also know some people like to feed them because they like to see them. But the, the deer is a really important host for the adult black-legged ticks. Um, and so what happens is when that tick is done feeding, wherever the deer happens to be, that's where it's going to fall off and lay its eggs. It's not making any choices, right? It's just going to finish feeding, drop off. And so if the deer is spending a lot of time kind of going in between your pasture and your woods, that's where the ticks are going to drop off, lay eggs, and then you could potentially build up a tick population on your property if you have a large number of deer like that. So just something to keep in mind there. And in terms of reducing tick bites while out riding, um, so one important thing to realize with the black-legged ticks is that they're not actively seeking hosts, right? They're not moving in the landscape. They're really only moving up and down in the landscape. So they do something called questing, where they'll climb up to the top of a blade of grass or some vegetation, and they just sit there with their arms outstretched. And as an animal brushes by and walks by them, they just grab a hold and then they'll find a place to bite that animal. So you can imagine if you're on a trail like this first picture we have here, where the vegetation is quite close to the area that your horse and you may be walking, um, you're going to have a much higher risk of encountering these questing ticks. Whereas if you can pick trails or if you can manage your trails so that they're wider and you keep the vegetation um, from brushing up against your horse as you're riding, that can also reduce your tick risk as well. I've had a lot of people ask me um, what is the best uh, spray that they can use for ticks. And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of really great options. Um, I thought this study was really interesting. This was done um, by a group out in Pennsylvania, and they were testing different concentrations of permethrin, which is a really common um, and well-known tick repellent. And so what they were doing, they were taking horses and they were applying a strip of different concentrations of this tick repellent. Um, you can see here they list it as a treatment zone and then they're actually placing ticks below that and seeing how many were being stopped by that concentration of that pesticide. Um, they use three different concentrations, 1.5, 5%, and 10%. Uh, and I will say that most commercial products are closer to about 0.5%. So your typical like fly and tick spray that we, we spray on our horse's legs um, tend to have much lower. And they just wanted to see, like, are these higher concentrations effective in deterring ticks? 
uh, and the answer is yes, with a caveat. Let me just walk you through this graph really fast. So this is looking at the percentage of ticks that were repelled, um, you know, anywhere from zero to 100%. And then these are the different concentrations of the permethrin, 10%, five and one and a half percent. And you can see at these higher concentrations, they actually had pretty good tick repellency, you know, even after 24 hours of application, um, they had over 80% repellency at this higher uh, concentration. However, these higher concentrations, although they did a good job of repelling ticks, it also resulted in significant skin irritation and skin damage um, to the point where the skin was peeling and it was raw and the horses had to be withdrawn from the study. So it, it just kind of is unfortunate and it really means that we need better research to come up with better tick control products. And it's also a good reminder of if something is not labeled for use on a horse, um, there could very, very, very well be a good reason. So yes, this, the higher concentrations would definitely repel the ticks, but it's not considered safe to use at those concentrations on a horse, unfortunately. So just some advice about using things off label. So really the, the best thing you can do is actually tick checks on your horse. And when you think about where to do a tick check, you can think about um, sort of the points of contact, where the horse is picking up ticks. And the points of contacts are primarily the face and the legs, because that's where they're gonna interact with these questing ticks. And then the ticks tend to move up um, once they get on an animal and they're looking sort of for like a warm, humid, dark area to settle in and feed. And so there was one study where researchers actually uh, looked at the entire horse and counted the number of ticks in the different regions of the body just to try to figure out where are most ticks attaching to horses. So where should home, where should um, horse owners look for the ticks? And they found that the vast majority of ticks were actually um, sort of at the base of the leg. So the chest and sort of at the base and in between the legs and on the belly, um, over 70% of the ticks were found in those regions. So yes, horses are big, but if you can just sort of concentrate your efforts on those regions of the horse, that could have a big impact on um, reducing the number of ticks that are on your horses. And it's also important to note that most ticks need to be attached for more than 24 hours before they're able to transmit pathogens. So if you're doing these checks regularly and you're able to get ticks off before they're engorged, you're going to also help to reduce the risk of pathogens to your horses. Um, I just want to give you a few more tick resources. Um, the University of Maine, if you're a Maine resident, has um, a really great tick testing program. You can send in any tick you find and they'll identify it for you for free, which is a great service. So if you're not sure if it's a dog tick or a black-legged tick, they can let you know. And if it does turn out to be a black-legged tick and you want to have it tested for pathogens, they do that as well for $20 a tick and they have a pretty fast turnaround time. Um, in addition to that, they also um, have a website that they keep updated in real time, um, as well as reports on the number of ticks that are submitted and what percentage carry pathogens. So, for example, um, last year when they looked at um, the black-legged ticks and they looked at the different pathogens, they saw that of the black-legged tick nymphs, about 21% were carrying the pathogen that causes Lyme disease, um, and the adults, about 43% of them carry the pathogen that causes Lyme disease, and that's pretty typical here in Maine. Um, and then anaplasma, about 9% of the nymphs are carrying the pathogen, and about 12% of the adults are carrying the anaplasma um, pathogen as well. Okay, so let's move on to mosquitoes, um, and this feels very timely. I know here in Maine, at least, we're starting to see Triple E, West Nile cases, um, and so it is it is a big concern. Uh, there are so many mosquito species. Here in Maine, we have 45 different species of mosquitoes, and you can kind of think about mosquitoes kind of broken up into two categories. You have your nuisance mosquitoes, and these are ones that bite and are painful, and us and our horses dislike them, but they're not transmitting pathogens. Um, most, most mosquitoes don't transmit pathogens, but there are definitely a number of species 
here and across the country where um, they are capable of transmitting different pathogens. Um, some species are very host specific, so on, some will only feed on birds, some will only feed on mammals, some have a wide host range. Um, the, only the females of all the mosquito species feed on blood, the males are just nectar feeders. And the activity period really varies by species. Some are morning biters, some are evening biters, some are daytime biters. But one thing they do share in common is that they're all developing in stagnant water. If you want to read a little bit more about the mosquito species here in Maine, you can scan the QR code. Um, it's a really cool document. It has all the species listed out. And then it'll say, if, is it a vector for Tripoli? Is it a vector for West Nile? What kind of habitat does it develop in? Um, and like when, what time of day does it typically bite? So it can give you some more information about um, your, your risk factors in your area. So obviously we are living in a world that does have a cl changing climate. Um, a lot of areas in the country are experiencing longer summers and fall as well as earlier springs. And what that means is that the mosquitoes have a larger chance um, to pick up these pathogens. So these pathogens are building up in our environment. And then because it has more of a chance to build up, it's more likely to spill over into humans and horses as well. So this is just a quick graphic um, that's showing basically the number of months when um, a particular mosquito called Aedes aegypti um, is active and able to transmit pathogens. So you can see in 2019, it's really not an issue here in Maine, um, but they are predicting as our environment is warming that we are going to possibly get new mosquito species that are also vectors of disease like this one here. So our, we have two sort of main um, mosquito-borne diseases here in New England. Um, and, and this ac across a lot of the country as well. So Eastern Equine Encephalitis, Triple E, um, this is a mosquito-borne disease. And this is a disease that is um, commonly associated with birds. So what happens is that we have a bird that flies in that has this um, pathogen that's carrying this virus. And the mosquito that typically feeds on birds is Culicetta melanura. And this is predominantly a bird feeder. And so as this mosquito is feeding on an infected bird, um, it then picks up that pathogen. And when it feeds going forward, any bird that it encounters could potentially transmit the pathogen to that. So that mosquito isn't a huge problem in and of itself, but we do have a number of bridge vectors that will feed on both birds and mammals. And those are the ones that can then pick up a pathogen from a bird and then bring it to a mammal. And that's when we start having issues with horses and humans contracting these diseases. And so this is typically something we see later in the season, um, especially here up north where our mosquitoes are dying um, you know, every winter uh, or the adult mosquitoes are dying every winter. We don't have year round breeding of mosquitoes typically. And so as we have more time for this pathogen to build up, um, there is going to be more of a risk to us on our horses. And then um, the West Nile transmission cycle is very similar. They do have some different uh, mosquito species that transmit it, but it's a very similar concept as well. So um, our lab and works with the main CDC and we do some of the mosquito surveillance in the state. Um, so we do have a number of sites here in Penobscot County where the university is um, that we are trapping mosquitoes weekly and then we do send them in and have them tested for pathogens. And if you're in another state, I almost guarantee you there's a very similar program you can look at um, on your state's uh, web pages and try to get the same sort of data that's available that we have here in Maine. Um, and so we do this mosquito surveillance every week to try to see, um, are we starting to pick up pathogens? And we do that through a couple different ways. Um, we have these CO2 light traps, which is this upper picture here. And the mosquitoes are attracted to it. And then there's a little fan that actually will suck them into this mesh netting. And then we can collect them and then send them off to be tested for pathogens. We also have these resting boxes, which are super low tech, um, just a black box that's in the environment. Um, and how this works is that some of those mosquito species that I talked about a minute ago, especially the bird feeders, they're considered a crypt species. So they like to find kind of a 
dark underground place to rest during certain periods of the day, especially after a blood meal. And so they find these boxes very attractive. And then we actually go out with this little insect vacuum and we vacuum up all the mosquitoes and then we send them off to be tested. And so I have the QR code for um, this site that has the real time data. Um, and I put this up here a few days. It might have even been updated since I've last put this up because I have heard about a number of um, different possible Triple E cases across the state. And so this is going to give you just an idea of of you know where it's circulating, um, how many cases are showing up, and it'll tell you whether or not it was in you know a horse or was in a wild bird or a human. But just uh, one caveat with this, like it does take time to go out and collect the mosquitoes and then send them off to be tested for pathogens, test them for pathogens, and then disseminate the information. So there's definitely a lag in this, inform in this information just because of the nature of data collection. Um, so I wouldn't just go off of this as, you know, oh, well, my county is not on here. I feel safe and protected. I would say once it starts, um, these diseases start popping up in the state, you might want to make sure that, you know, your horse is protected and um, not just go off this as whether or not you're safe. And also we can't cover the whole state. Like that's, it's just impossible. We're obviously not in every single um, town across the whole, the whole state, unfortunately. Um, so some mosquito management. Mosquitoes are very frustrating and difficult to manage in a lot of ways. Um, so I think the first biggest thing is obviously talk to your vet about vaccination for Tripoli and West Nile virus. We're very fortunate that we do have good vaccines for these for our horses. Um, and also it's important to talk to your vet about how long those vaccines last, um, especially depending on your horse's life stage and when you vaccinate your horse. So some of these vaccines are only lasting six months. And so it's important to keep in mind that you know if you're vaccinating your horse in April in the spring before show season is starting for you um, you know by the time fall rolls around and we're really starting to see an uptick in Tripoli and West Nile virus cases your protection could be waning um, but that is something that you would talk to your vet about and they would help you make that decision so a few things you can do to help protect your horses. Um, fans can help disrupt flight. Mosquitoes are terrible flyers. Um, if you've ever been outside on a windy day, you'll be like, oh, it's lovely. There's no mosquitoes out. It's because they just can't, they can't hack it when it's windy. Um, so having a fan in a shelter for a horse can have a huge difference. I know when the mosquitoes are really bad, my horses are in their shelter standing right in front of their fans um, and does a really good job. Also, make sure you turn off any lights outside your barn at night that are near animals. Um, mosquitoes are very attracted to light. Um, that's one of the ways we trap them is we put a light trap out. Even if we don't have CO2, we'll collect a ton of mosquitoes because they're just attracted to the light. So, you know, don't draw in the mosquitoes to where your animals are um, spending their time at night time. So something to keep in mind. Um, mosquitoes rely on sort of vegetation. So sort of like ticks need that vegetation for that humidity. Mosquitoes are sensitive in that as well. And so what they do um, during certain times of the day, they're going to spend a lot of their time resting in the vegetation. So they're going to be on the underside of vegetation hanging out. And then once they pick up that CO2 odor from, from animals exhaling, they're going to follow that to the animal. So if you can keep your vegetation short in an an area around your horses, um, either through mowing or cutting back an area so you can have more sunlight and airflow in there. Um, that can help sort of push the mosquitoes further out. Um, it's it's amazing. So this is a picture of our property, and we live in like the deep woods of Maine right next to a swamp. So the mosquitoes are horrible. And when I first wanted to bring my horses home, I wasn't sure if we'd be able to do it just because the mosquitoes were so bad and I thought they'd be miserable. And so what we did is we went through and we cut down a large number of trees. Um, my horses are in the woods on a track system, but we did designate one area kind of on top of the hill where we cut down trees and we cleared out all the sort of undergrowth. And during the day or during the evenings and mornings when the mosquitoes are bad, this is the only place my horses hang out. And, and same with me. Like I, I do not want to be on their track deep in the woods um, during really bad times when the mosquitoes are out. So it, it's sort of amazing what you can do with landscape management to help reduce the mosquitoes on your property.
Um, finally, mosquitoes are, like I said, water, breeding in water, and some of them breed in very, very small amounts of water. So it's just important to try to discard items or flip items upside down that hold water. So that would be things like tires, tarps, old wheel, old wheelbarrows. I know we all have them. Um, also, the water trough is a perfect con uh, condition for mosquito breeding. They, the immature mosquitoes are feeding on like the detritus from like old vegetation mixed with water. And so, you know, water troughs have little bits of hay and grass that get in it. And so just cleaning and dumping those weekly can have a, also have an impact on reducing mosquito populations. So let's move on to horse and deer flies. Um, I will say these are incredibly difficult to manage, and that's because they're not breeding on farms. So um, at least we don't have to blame ourselves for these. If we have them on our farms, it's not our fault. Um, these typically breed off farm in small bodies of water. So small ponds, small kind of boggy, wet areas, ditches, things like that. And they're extremely strong flyers. So they can fly for miles. So even if your property is completely dry and you don't have any water sources um, somehow, that, you know, a few miles down the road might, and they can no problem fly in from there. Um, these are potential disease vectors. They're pretty understudied in that area. Um, and so I feel like a lot of time we don't know about all the potential diseases and we may be capable of vector. And we do know they can vector a few things like equine infectious anemia, which although is pretty rare in the country, um, if we ever did have an outbreak, it is, you know, a concern. I mean, of course, and that's what everyone gets their Coggins tests for. So again, that is quite um, a rare disease we have. The reasons these hurt so much when they bite us and the horses um, is that they have these basically their mouth parts are like a pair of inverted scissors. Um, so you can see here they have these like razor sharp mouth parts. And what they do is they go up to the horse or, or us and they use those mouth parts to slash in opposite directions. And then it causes the blood to start pooling and then it uses its sponge like part of its mouth to lap up the blood. And besides being painful, these are also areas that now could potentially get bacteria in them. And then there's a num number of other flies that don't bite but love to feed on um, bodily secretions like this. So again, that is another bacteria um, concern as well. Really, the only kind of management options for them are either trapping or like physically protecting your horse through fly sheets and shelters. Um, there are a number of commercially available fly traps that seem to have some success. Um, they are kind of pricey. Uh, the Epps Biting Fly Trap and the H Trap, they're definitely an investment, but there's no... Um, you're not really having to replace anything. You're not going to have like a long-term investment. It's kind of a one and done. So the Epps biting fly trap uses soapy water. And then the H trap just uses a cup that they dry out and die in there. Um, you can also buy these, it's called bug balls and you can spray them with a really sticky substance called tangle foot. I've used these. I haven't had great success. Um, they might do better in areas that have sort of larger, more open um, areas. I, the part of the problem is using a tangle foot or anything sticky is that it gets covered in dust and dead bugs and then and then the flies aren't going to stick to it and also flies are less likely to land on it if they see the other dead flies they're not that smart they're just they're just for whatever reason they're not going to land on it when it's already covered in bugs it, they don't know it's a trap they just don't want to be there um, with all those other bugs um, there's also a number of homemade options you can make yourself. Um, the Horse Pal was a company that made a really effective trap that's just recently um, gone out of business or if they're no longer producing them. But you can make a very similar trap yourself. They're called Manning Traps. I put the QR code here so that you can, um, if you want to scan it and get the instructions on how to make it. I made one in an afternoon. It was very simple. And even on my property, which doesn't have very good line of sights and I don't have all that many um, horse and deer flies, I do still capture a fair number of them. It's been kind of fun to have it set up. Um, and then here's another sort of new one. I'm not as familiar with this and I'm not really familiar with the research that gone in was gone into designing this. Um, but again, here's a QR code if you want to see this homemade one. Basically, it works by both of these traps work by as the sun reflects off these black surfaces, whether it's a black ball or the black kind of plastic tarp in these um, water trays. Um, the heat signature that's coming off of black kind of looks like an animal to the um, horsefly. And so then they fly there thinking 
it's an animal they can bite and then they either get trapped in the soapy water or they fly up which is what they instinctually do to get away um and they get trapped in like a a cup in this trap probably the most important thing when you're putting out these traps for <clears throat> deer and horse flies is placement. And it's amazing. Like just moving it a few feet can make a significant impact. So when you think about where to put a trap, um, you're going to want to basically put it between the woods and an open area where your horse is feeding. Horse, horse flies move back and forth between wooded edges and open pastures to feed. So you want to try to intercept them there. Um, also, shelter has been shown to be really important. Uh, Tabannon flies typically don't like going into shelters, so if horses are offered an option of having a shelter, they will use it to get away from um, the, the biting flies. And then finally, uh, fly sheets. So you've probably seen a lot of zebra fly sheets on the market lately, and there's a reason for this. Um, zebras are bit less often by tabanids than horses, and it really has to do with the stripes. So you can see here was a study um, in the same area, and they're looking at zebras and horses, and the red line is the flight path that these tabanid flies, the horse and deer flies, were taking around these animals, and the blue stars represents where they landed. So you can see they're really able, really navigating around the horses a lot landing multiple times on each horse where the zebra they're kind of going up and getting kind of confused and they're having a hard time figuring out where to land and then they fly off um and so the study has also been done where they've put fly sheets that are black white or striped and they basically saw significantly fewer um of these horse and deer flies landing on horses that had the zebra stripe so if you're going to invest in a fly sheet you might as well get a zebra one because it will help um reduce the number of um the debanded flies and if you have a gray horse it'll actually look like you have a zebra which is very cool Okay, so now I want to move on to the insect that I spend most of my time studying, um, and these are stable flies. So it's important to note they look very similar to house flies, and um, but house flies don't bite; stable flies do. And these are typically the ones that are biting the legs and bellies of horses. So the horses that are stomping, it's probably because of stable flies. Whereas house flies are typically more the ones that are in the barn, that are hanging out in your grain room, um, that are on the windows. They're annoying and they can definitely spread bacteria, but they're not, they're not actually biting us or our horses. Um, for the stable flies, males and females are blood feeders and they can build up in very dense numbers. Um, Stable flies are primarily breeding and rotting vegetation. And these round bale feeding sites are sort of primary areas for fly development. So as the round bale is sitting there, a lot of it's wasted and the manure and urine is also getting mixed in and it's really creating like optimal breeding sites for stable flies. Um, there was one study I read that estimated each round bale feeding site could contribute to about half a million stable flies to a farm. So you can imagine if you have multiple round bale feeding sites that you're just letting naturally decompose that can increase uh, the fly pressure on your property. So one thing you can do, um, you don't have to pick it all up, but just spreading it out and sort of breaking up that thick mat of vegetation will help it dry up and it will make it a lot less hospitable to stable fly development. Um, even barns that have these big, um, what do they call them, dumpsters to put manure in, which is great, and they have hauled off. Um, when I go to these farms, I can usually find a ton of stable fly and house flies developing around the edges of these. For whatever reason, like the stuff, you know, some manure spills out, some hay spills out, and leaves um, kind of get added to the mat of sort of filth and hay. And these are great stable fly breeding areas. So even if you are having it hauled off, just remember to clean around it because that can definitely contribute to flies on the farm as well. Oh, <laughs> these are two of my students from a previous summer um, that actually did enjoy this. This They loved it. We were digging through old hay and manure for stable fly pupae. And so this was on a farm. This is a very small area, maybe 10 by 15 square feet, where um, the owners frequently fed their donkeys hay. Um, donkeys wasted a lot of hay and they stood around and they also, you know, accumulated manure in these areas. And even though this was a small area, this was probably the area that was contributing the most to the stable flies on their farm. When you lifted up these mats of vegetation, it was just like a sea of developing stable flies. It was incredible. So even sometimes a small area can have a big impact on fly populations. Um, 
A little bit on staple fly traps. My biggest pet peeve are all these baited traps I'm constantly seeing advertised of help your horse stop stomping, get rid of flies on your farm. Baited traps do not do anything for staple flies. Baited traps, anything that has a bait, you know, any of that stinky stuff you add to water, um, those are only going to be collecting house flies. And even that probably only works for about one to two weeks. And then you need to get new bait because after a while, they're not going to attract house flies either. Um, there is one trap that works really well. And this is what I primarily use for my research. It's this blue and black trap here. It's called the Nizzy trap. Um, and it's probably the most economical because you're not having to replace anything. Um, the flies fly up into the cup and they die and you can just dump it out once in a while. And this is what I use to collect flies for my research. And I can collect easily 100 in a few hours, um, depending on how many flies are there. There are some sticky products as well, some sticky traps called Olsen traps or these commercially available ones. But again, just keep in mind, if it's sticky, it's probably only going to last two weeks max before you need to replace it. Um, you can build your own Nizzy trap. The The instructions are online and free. So that's um, that's a really great, and, and it's not too hard to build. I've done it. Um, I have a, num a number of the traps set up around the farms here on campus. Um, biological control is another great option. Um, I will say, though, if you are going to invest in these so-called fly predators or any of these um, little tiny parasitic wasps, you do want to make sure that the company you're getting them from um, is reputable and that you're getting the things you think you're getting. So you should always ask what species they have. Um, if they're not willing to tell you, I personally wouldn't buy from them. Um, and if it's a mix, ask what percentage of each of each species as well. And, and you should also ask them if they have an I, um, an, a taxonomist or an entomologist that actually verifies the species. There was one study that ordered from a number of companies, and they actually found that a lot of, or several companies were sending stuff that was not what they thought they were raising. Um, and so you just don't want to waste your money doing that. There's a couple of species that are most effective, um, at least here in the Northeast, um, actually really around the, the country, um, these three species are, are considered sort of the gold standard of biological control for um, for stable and house flies. There's another species, the Snossonia vitropinus, which is not effective. Some companies do sell it, um, and that's why it's important to ask what species they are selling you. Um, really, the most important thing to know about biological control is that these parasitoids have incredibly small flight ranges. I mean, we're talking for some of them feet, right? Their whole life, they're only going to move a few feet. So it's really important to release them where the flies are breeding. So you really have to look at your farm, try to figure out where the flies are breeding. And this is not necessarily where you're seeing adult flies, right? This would be, you know, areas that typically gather, um, you know, manure and old hay, um, any sort of rotting vegetation, anywhere around manure areas. Um, if you have matted stalls, sometimes along the edges of the matted stalls, they might be breeding kind of along those edges as well. So you just want to make sure that if you're going to invest in this, that you're releasing them in areas that they're actually able to make an impact. And some of these companies will say that you can do this monthly. All the research has shown that you really have to do it weekly or every other week in order to have a significant impact on the fly populations. Um, so just keep that in mind. It's, you know, it's it's not the cheapest option, but it, it does have an impact if you're if you can make sure you're releasing them in the right places and releasing them often enough. Um Real quick, just this was a really interesting, really recent study that compared fly sprays on horses, um, and they looked at three natural fly sprays and then four synthetic fly sprays, sort of common ones that a lot of us encounter, and they looked at it over time. Um, so 30 minutes, 10 hours, 24 hours, they did it further than that, but I think a lot of people were reapplying at 24 hours, so that's what I'm going to show you. So you can see, um, surprisingly, even some of these natural products, which are sort of newer products on the market, um, have really good repellency, um, even after 10 hours and 24 hours. So for example, if we look at EcoVet, um, even after 24 hours, they have a 77% fly repellency, um, which is pretty good. Whereas Bronco, after 24 hours, has a 20% um, fly repellency. But I will say, you know, 
you also have to take cons into consideration costs. Um, EcoVet, which probably performed the best out of all of these long term, is also the most expensive. Bronco is the cheapest. So if you're just planning on going out for maybe a trail ride, maybe you don't want to use your expensive fly spray. Maybe Bronco is you know perfectly good enough for you because you're still going to have you know, 50 to 70% fly repellency for the, the amount of time that you're riding. So just something good to keep in mind. Um, I was sort of surprised by these results. Um, and the synthetics can vary a lot as well, the different formulations and the different sort of additives they, they use. And then, of course, sunlight, rain, um, sweat, all of these things will break down fly sprays and make them less effective. So even though most of the fly sprays on the market say they last for so many days, I think most people realize that in reality, we're probably not seeing that kind of benefit for that long. Um, then I'm just going to wrap up the presentation by talking about some of my research that I'm working on with stable flies. This is an area that um, I'm really passionate about, mostly because my horse really hates stable flies, which is how I started getting into it, thinking, well, how hard can it be to manage them? And the answer is very difficult. Um, so one of the things about stable flies is that they're migrating back to farms each year, unless you're down in like far southern U.S. So anywhere that has like a hard winter, they typically are migrating back every year. So one of the things I asked was, you know, when are they arriving? When are their populations increasing? And what's really driving their populations? And can we use that information to predict when they're going to really become a problem and when farmers need to start managing their flies? So some previous research has been done, and it really depends on the region of the world we're looking at. So for example, the stable fly populations really are driven by um, rainfall in these really dry, hot regions, um, whereas in sort of the more humid south, they're really limited by high temperatures. Um, and then other periods uh, are looking kind of at different weather events, and then some areas of the world have not really found any kind of relationships at all. So I worked um, on these five farms in our region. I put out 10 sticky traps each week and I collected them and for two years and then also record temperature and precipitation. So I can try to figure out what's driving stable fly populations here in New England. Um, and it's interesting because, so this is our two years of data and these are our five farms. And you can see that there's a lot of within variation, or no, I'm sorry, the within variation is very low. So within a year, so for example, the black is all 2022 and the orange is all 2021. Um, you can see that the patterns are pretty similar across the farms, but within years, there's a lot of variation. So it really made us think that there must be something that has to do with weather that is driving and making it different. So, um, you know, we, we do definitely have fluctuations from year to year. And I'm not going to go too much into the statistics or any of that, um, but basically what we found here in New England, the populations are really being driven by um, our, our cooler temperatures. So our cooler temperatures are what is limiting the stable flies here in New England. So as we start having warmer summers, longer summers, we can expect to see more stable flies in these regions. And I'm guessing the same is going to go for people in the Midwest as well. So basically, the implications are this, you know, by being able to predict the stable fly populations, we'll be able to predict when's the best time to start releasing parasitoids, or maybe when's the best time to apply a pesticide to try to knock them back down, um, or to conduct farm cleanup and land management. Um, and then just the very last thing I'm going to end with, um, my a big portion of my PhD is looking at new biological control options for stable flies. And I am looking at this particular mite. It's called a macrochelid mite. Um, and it's very interesting because it eats both eggs and larvae of stable and house flies. But the thing that's very sort of unique about this is that it can sense when the environment it's living in is starting to dry up and not as many flies are developing. And what it will do, it will actually hitch a ride on the adult fly. And then when the adult fly goes to lay its eggs in a new environment, it'll drop off and then it has a lovely new buffet set up and ready and waiting for them. So it's just kind of amazing. So one of the limiting factors of parasitoids is that they're not able to move very far. Whereas these guys are being moved exactly where the stable flies are breeding, regardless of where you're releasing them as long as there's some flies breeding there. So you don't have to worry about, well, you know, where's the, where are most of the flies breeding? Like they'll find their way there because they're using these adult flies to get there. 
<clears throat> and so one of the big um, areas of my research I'm looking at are, okay, we know that they're eating the eggs and the larvae, but are they also impacting the adult flies? So if we compare our fly to an, maybe a runner, an athlete, you know, if, if this person is running a couple miles, probably no problem. Um, now, if we add these mites onto the fly, it doesn't seem very big to us, but in relative to the fly's size, it's actually quite large. It would be, you know, if we had a dozen cats attached to us or a runner pulling, a, you know, a large amount of weights, we can imagine that maybe this would have an impact on the flight ability as well. And so in addition to eating um, the eggs and larvae, maybe it's also going to be able to also help reduce the amount that a lot of these adult flies are capable of going out and looking for a host. Um, so can stable flies or can mites reduce stable fly activity? Uh, to be determined, we are doing some different projects where we're actually tethering flies that have mites attached to them and then measuring their flight potential. So really fun, cool, interesting stuff, I think. Um, and hopefully <laughs> by the time I finish my PhD, I'll be able to answer some of these questions a little better. So there are a lot of really great resources out there. One of my favorite books, if you're interested in reading more about equine pests, is Pests and Parasites of Horses by Erica Mactinker. She is the person who studies um, equine pests. She's on my committee and she knows so much and is amazing. If you want to read more about Lyme disease, which is super interesting, The Ecology of a Complex System is an excellent book. This looks at it from sort of ecological point of view. So if you're just trying to understand like why are ticks and Lyme disease becoming such a problem, this is a great read. Um, and then I also developed um, a Northeast Regional IPM plan um, for an, and created an equine pest profile that I have linked to this QR code that has a lot more other pests um, on that as well that we just didn't have time to cover. So I just want to say thank you. Um, I'm always happy to talk about equine pests. So if you have any questions about this presentation or any um, insect questions at all, I'd love to hear from you. And if you are a farmer in Maine, if you own horses or cattle. I'm always looking for more um, people, more farms to partner with, do future research. Um, for example, some of our future research is going to be surveying naturally occurring mite species on farms, and so I will need some more farms to partner with. So please feel free to send me an email if that's something you would be willing to um, let us go do, so look for mites on your farm. So with that, I'll say thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Oh my gosh, I learned so much and I have a ton of questions. Um, why don't you take a drink of water, Alyssa? <laughs> um, I'm going to release a poll for everyone who's tuning in. Um, and you can think of some questions that you might want to ask. I know there's a couple in the chat. Oh, yeah. Um, should I start answering questions? Do you want to give people a second to do the poll? Um, I think we can start. Um, yeah, you can probably see them. I'll read them out loud just because mm -hmm. we're recording. Um, okay. Do you know if you pull off an engorged tick and squish it, will the abdominal contents, eggs, question mark, successfully hatch the next spring or does popping the tick kill the eggs in that tick? Interesting question. Um, honestly, not one I've spent a lot of time thinking about. I would imagine. So <clears throat> when a tick drops off and lays its eggs, if it drops off in a place that's conducive, so meaning, you know, it has the right humidity, it has the right protection, the eggs will hatch. So I think if you were to squish the tick, most of the eggs would also be killed. If for some reason any of those eggs are still viable, I think as long as you're dropping it on an area that um, is hot and dry, no, nothing is going to survive. But I will think squishing the tick would basically kill most of the eggs as well. Their eggs are kind of fragile. They're soft and squishy and, you know, I don't think they would do well being smushed like that. Okay. Um, and then what is the proportion of dung beetles caught in these bug traps? Oh, yeah. Up? Great question. So the reason I like the Nizzy trap is that it has almost no bycatch. So I only get, um, I get stable flies. I get an occasional one of the tabanid horse or um, deer flies. 
and almost nothing else. So I have never caught a dung beetle um, in any of these traps. I will say the sticky traps tend to have a lot more bycatch just because anything that happens to fly by and get stuck on it, you know, the wind blows them as they're flying, they could be stuck. Um, so if you're at all concerned about that, which I also feel very strongly about the dung beetles, um, yeah, I just stay away from the sticky traps and go with one of these other traps. And I've never caught any dung beetles in those. I will say, though, those baited traps that have um, the bait in them, if people leave them to sit out too long, I have seen like carrion beetles and things like that get in them. So that's something to keep in mind, too. All right. Sticking with the dung beetle theme, um, our dung beetles have mites. Are those similar to the ones on the flies? Yes. It, yes. It's very interesting. So if you think about insect, pretty much every insect has some sort of mite associated with it. But um, you're right in that the dung beetles often carry these very similar mites. A lot of times those are a type of macrochelid mite as well. Um, and there's really not a whole lot of research of what impact it has on the dung beetles. Most people have said it doesn't really have much of an impact on them, but they're not also, you know, they're they're spending a lot of their life crawling as opposed to just flying like the flies are. But yeah, they are very similar. Um, there's a whole host of sort of different mites that live in these manure areas that are associated with soil and sort of dung inhabiting insects. But yeah, they're very similar. Neat. All right. Let's see. Uh, what was your GDD at base 15? Is that what the 15 references? Yeah, so this is referring to the degree days. Um, we went with a, that's 15 degrees Celsius was our base. Um, and we went with that because the minimum flight threshold for a stable fly is somewhere between, and, and development is somewhere between 10 and 20 degrees. And so we, we found that really the degree days um, when we used a base of 15 degrees Celsius is what gave us the best predictor of um, population increases. So basically, how much warm weather have you we accumulated over that 15 degree Celsius threshold? Hopefully that makes sense. Awesome. Thank you. All right. I have a question and I I don't remember if you touched on it or not about, you know, water quality in, in relation to mosquitoes. Like, can they develop in poor quality water? I'm thinking of like green, like algae. Yes. Magnet. Yeah, they okay. love that. Yeah, because that's what they're feeding on, right? The the immature mosquitoes are feeding on like the detritus, the algae, the sort of broken down vegetation. So yeah, they can they can um, reproduce in very poor water quality, and we typically don't see them. We don't see them in lakes and rivers nearly as much as we would like little small stagnant ponds of water or pools of water. Sure. Yeah. Around my farm, you know, like I'll pay attention, like a little puddle in a tarp. I'm like, oh, there's larva. I need to dump that yeah. out. <laughs> but I just put in like a little, you know, goldfish pond type of thing mm -hmm. pond, and I cannot keep it clean. And I'm like, was this a bad idea? <laughs> so I think I need to do yeah. something or something. But there are some products like, you know, BT, mosquito bits. Um, it's a it's a bacteria you can add to stagnant water like that that will help control the mosquito larvae as well. So something that's another option. Awesome. Well, I don't see any more questions in the chat. Um, Alyssa's emails up there for anyone who would like um, more information if, or if you have a question that you think of later. Um, Alyssa, thank you so much. This has been great. Um, I'm probably <laughs> going to follow up with you after this for some things and- Please. <laughs> Yeah, it's wonderful. Thank you so much for being the end speaker of our speaker series. And yeah, thanks so much.